taking you back into 1 Peter. We're going to be in the second chapter, and I'm going to ask you, please, as you turn there, I'm going to ask that God uh, touch our hearts and our minds to uh, receive, because a lot of times we come into this place and everybody has a need. Coming into the building, we all have needs that God would touch our, our hearts and our minds today to receive if it's just a crumb from the master's table or if it's the whole loaf, that it be sufficient for this day for your needs. Uh, and ask that in Jesus' name. Um, so, this is a little bit complex here. Um, I finally have figured out why Peter has a kind of a bad rap in his first and second epistles, writings, that if we, this church is primarily Pauline in its focus, after the Gospels we focus on Paul's writing. So it's very apparent to me that it'd be very easy to read Peter with a Pauline mentality and say, well, does this actually jive? Is this in concert? And never put on the spectacles of this man, Simon Peter, who, unlike the Apostle Paul, uh, we're talking about a man who followed Jesus around for three plus years in his public ministry, who was a complete failure while Jesus walked the earth with, while he followed him. So there's a frame of reference when we read Peter that we have to put on. It's like putting on a pair of glasses and reading Peter's writing with the frame of reference of someone who has experienced something, again, he is an eyewitness to Christ, therefore we take his testimony, his words, and value them as an eyewitness to Jesus. Therefore, what he lays out appears to be perhaps subjective in its presentation, but is not. Now, we will recap a little bit of the first chapter, but I'm going to jump right into the second chapter because we we'll almost have to take a step back once we get in here. I've put on the board, that is uh, verse 2 of chapter 2, but um, here's the problem. When people begin reading this, chapter 2, wherefore laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, Oh, let me just read three verses, that's all. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. If so be ye have tasted the Lord is gracious. That's all I want to touch on in this second chapter. A couple of things come to my mind. If you are a person who reads commentaries, you, you will be confronted with a dilemma. And the dilemma is every single commentator says that the laying aside of all malice, guile, hypocrisies, envies, and so forth suggests this is behavior that can be put off completely. And I am reading this with a different set of eyeballs. So in order to understand what verse 1 really entails, I'm going to begin at verse 2. That's the logical thing for Pastor Scott. Go backwards. All right. So what does this say? Uh, King James, as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. Let's look at this. And I want to pick this apart. It's kind of interesting, and I want you to follow the line of thinking that, he's, that Peter is using this type of verbiage. Remember, this is what is so horrible. When we forget context, it's easy to make things become muddled and take them out of context. You must leave this in the framework of what he is saying. So he's telling us, like, as arti geneta, as newborn, and there are different words in the Greek, brefe, and this, he could have just said as babies or in other words, this is an adjective, arti geneta, describing the babies. He could have not described the babies like John and the close of 1 John when he says, little children, keep yourself from idols. 
and even gives the little children, telling you, we think we read that and we think it's little children in the church, but in fact it's young Christians. Keep yourselves from idols. That's a very good message for today's church, but not the message today. So as newborn babies, he didn't have to give an adjective, but he does. As newborn babies, to logikon, our King James, our King James translates, desire, desire the sincere milk of the word. Logikon. Only one other place that this word occurs, and that is in Romans 12. We, I taught on this one time. We translated that in Romans 12 as your reasonable service. But I want you to take a good look at this word. It, too, is an adjective. And in Romans, being translated reasonable, or we've said logical, or, or at the very least, uh, and I'm going to give a better description here. Adolon, which is without. There's an A here, so without guile. Another adjective. Both of these adjectives are describing milk. You know, some people like chocolate milk. Some people like strawberry-flavored milk. Here it is the... Uh, we're looking at, at the root of this, the word, from we get our word logos, the word. So here, logikon, reasonable, rooted in the word of God, without, in fact, the A in the Greek throws it in reverse, so if it was guile, it would be the reverse of guile. It's pure, it's unadulterated milk that you are to, here's the key word, to desire. Now, translating this becomes extremely relevant for our understanding of this whole text. And just how important this text is to today's church is radical. So, desire here is a verb in the imperative, aorist, active. So, the concept of desiring to long after, to desire, is not like uh, the smorgasbord of stuff put out and you say, mm, you know, I kind of feel like I'd like that food over there, maybe. Have, you ever had a yen for something, a craving? You're driving in your car, you're driving home, and all of a sudden you have this yen for potato chips. Oh, salty potato chips. You ever have that? Not, not say, some, some craving. You go, I, don't, I don't know why I feel like that. You have a craving. And you can't get rid of it until you go and buy that bag of potato chips, and then you shove them in your mouth, and you've, it's, in two minutes it's gone. The craving was an hour. Two minutes, the chips are gone. The salt's all over your face. <laughs> that was good. Right? So, did anybody have to imperatively tell you to have that desire? No? No. It was there for whatever the reason. Now, if you're, a, if you're one of these uh, Christians that likes to blame everything on the devil, but sure, the devil told me at 2 o'clock in the morning I was supposed to have those salty potato chips. Right? But we have inner, inner instinctive cravings sometimes. That's our body sometimes telling us, you need this. Sometimes it's salt, deficiency, or whatever. Here we have this imperative to desire, to long for, to yearn, and it's active. That means that you and I are doing something. We are the ones, we are the subject desiring or longing for. So, as newborn babes or babies, that we are to desire actively and imperatively, and plural, that's all of us, we are to, to, to desire this logikon, adolon, without guile or unadulterated, coming back to the word, which is milk, we are to, we are to desire this, in that, hina, in that, in, into, we may grow. This is a very interesting concept here, that we may grow. And I'm going to put that we may. We may grow. This verb, oxe fete, subjunctive, aorist, passive. Now, why do I do these things? Because I love to just chop down people's erroneous ideas somehow. You can add one cubit, one inch 
to your life breath or your stature. God's Word declares it, but the church is ever trying to get you to grow. You grow. <laughs> grow. Like as if that's going to do something, right? It's like, just like going out to the apple tree and saying, apples, right? Yeah, that's all is going to happen is your neighbors are going to go. <laughs> okay, then. So it's important to point out that the growth, although it seems contradictory, the growth is in the passive that means that we are not growing ourselves, but passively something is going on internally that we are not doing of ourselves, but God is. This word is extremely important through Scripture. If you are reading, I believe it's in Matthew 6, when Jesus says, Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They don't toil, but yet they grow. Or the wheat and the darnel in Mark's Gospel, where he says, They'll grow up together. And then at the end, or in Paul's writing where he says, I, I watered or I planted, Apollos watered, God gave the increase. So it's God that gives the increase. It's God that does the growing. You ever seen kids of a certain age, you know, where they're busy writing, marking their height on the wall? Yeah, some of us did that too, but some of your kids may be doing that. And your reaction when you haven't seen those kids in a long time, my, how you've grown. And kids have the idea that they can stand up a little taller, they might look a little bigger. But a child cannot make himself or herself grow either. So these are natural and spiritual concepts, but that we might grow subjunctively, which means a mood of possibility. There, there is that, that if we are contingent upon the desiring and feeding upon this milk, we may grow into salvation. Now, that irks some people because, especially for the evangelists of the day, one trip, it's like a one-stop shopping trip, one shop down the altar, and you're saved. But let me just tell you, Peter's not the only one to say that you should grow into salvation. Salvation, in and of itself, we say, well, how is a person saved? That you faith on the Lord Jesus Christ? Your faith in Him makes you a believer in Christ? And for your faith, he plants his new life in you, and a new journey begins. Uh, that is a journey, not a point of arrival. So therefore, we are growing into salvation. And I, I really think there's nothing wrong. Some of the earlier church fathers did not want to deal with this, so they conveniently removed it and said it was a mistake. Poor Peter. All right. Don't mess with his writing. And... Then something at the end of this, the tail end of this, is actually verse 3 here. If, if you have tasted, and again, this D, this is a verb, indicative, aorist. This D right here is called the middle deponent. And all that means in the Greek grammar, it means it is something that you must do for yourself. There is no active voice. You must do it for yourself. I cannot taste the Lord for you. You must taste the Lord. Or the psalmist, Psalm, Psalm 34, taste and see that the Lord is good. Although Peter omits the see part. Do you know why? Because he just finished saying earlier regarding the sight of Christ that be in the first chapter, 1 Peter, first chapter, verse 8, Whom having not seen ye love, and whom though now ye see him not, yet believing ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. So he deliberately left out, he's quoting from Psalm 34, leaves out the seeing part because only he had seen Christ. But he says, if you have tasted, and it's in the middle voice because I cannot taste God or his word for you. You must do that. If you have tasted hoti, because or that, we have a, an adjective describing kurios Lord that is good, good, the Lord. And of course, the, the word order for the Greek would be a little bit different than we would speak it, but that you may grow into salvation if you have tasted, that is for yourself, and you have seen, essentially, without the seeing portion, the Lord is good. 
Now let me just tell you, from that one, uh, Christos ho kurios developed a whole frame that God, Christ literally, Christ is good. And a whole doctrine developed from that saying Christ is good. Well, Christ is good, but that's not the essence of what was being said. If you have tasted, each must do the tasting. Now, why am I telling you all this? Because this whole second verse that I've written out, second and third verse that I've written out, presupposes something. Presupposes that you and I have understood as we're reading this letter that the wherefore that begins the second uh, chapter, first verse, makes us go back to what came before. Anytime you encounter a therefore or a wherefore, you must go back. He's presupposing then that being born again, that verse 22 and 23, let me read them. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, that is unhypocritical love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God. So this imagery being placed in our minds, if we are putting ourselves in the place of the recipients of this letter, is that the birthing process, going back to a natural concept, is God's word, the seed, being planted in us and bringing forth, just like a mother bringing forth a child, now a new creature has been birthed. Now, let me ask the question. How many here have had babies in their household? Babies, show me hands, babies. Or, or watch somebody's baby. Okay, close enough. <laughs> so you know that a baby, it's legendary. The appetite is insatiable. And contrary to what mothers think about, oh, we've got to get the baby, we've got to paint the nursery a nice color and get it those cute little frilly things, the baby could care less about that. Just give me the milk. <laughs> at 2 o'clock in the morning, at 3 o'clock in the morning, does not care about the hour, just give me the milk, feed me. That's all the baby cares about. Now, you've been here, you remember, Dr. Scott was plenty right about this. Babies are born like this, flatheads. And all they want is what they want, and they'll cry to get what they want because they're just a bundle of wants. I want. Well, you don't have to tell a baby, now, drink milk. A baby, instinctively, there's something intuitive. And you daddies, if you tried this, you must have a little bit of sympathy for the mama. Just holding the baby, if you've made the mistake of holding the baby, you men, with your shirt off, I hope that you had the experience of that little mouth chopping down right there, thinking, oh, that's a good little bit. And you watch how carefully. A baby's plenty smart. If there's no milk, the baby will spit it out of its mouth. Try and put a finger in a baby's mouth. It'll spit out the finger because there's no milk. Now, a baby does not have to be told, coerced, or explained. There is the nipple. That is my source of sus. There's not even a rational thing. It, it just, <laughs> right? And then all of a sudden, here's, you know, a symphony of noise is going on. Quiet. There's only one thing to soothe. There's only one thing to nourish. There's only one thing that can even, that the child can even connect with. It is from the mother's breast. Now believe me, in fact, this was the message I was going to deliver on Mother's Day and I decided now, some of you mothers need to wait a little while. I'll give you appreciation where it's due, believe me. And you uh, husbands and uh, men should be appreciative. You don't have to, you may have to wake up. If you're a bottle person, formula in the bottle to warm it, and you fathers waking up and sleepwalking, uh, <laughs> you don't even know what you put in that hot pot of water, but at 2 o'clock in the morning, who cares, right? But Peter is using this frame of reference, calling 
these converts. And we need to be very careful about how we handle this. Because if it's not handled correctly, this verse, you're going to end up with thinking that somehow milk is bad. There are two other places in the scripture where milk is referred to as the word. One of them is in 1 Corinthians. And without, without this balance of explaining why understanding verse 2 is radically important to understand what comes before and what will come after, remember, he starts off by saying, laying aside all malice, guile, hypocrisy, envies, and evil speakings as newborn babes, long for, desire. So the first thing I want to do is I want you to make some notes here. Um, you see where we have this word which would be translated uh, sincere in your King James, sincere, all right, which I have up here as adolon. The root of this would be guile. The A puts it in reverse, so without, unadulterated, pure, without, without deceit, all right? It's noteworthy to say that this word, adolon, less the A, is the word that appears in the first verse where it says, and all guile. So you have to understand, he's not speaking necessarily about you stopping a behavior. See, this is what is very frustrating to me. People come into the church, and then people tell them, don't do this, don't do that, don't do that. So for, for the poor person who doesn't understand, they'll try and put that behavior aside, thinking, well, this is what I've been instructed to do, when in fact, I hate to tell you this. This is why what is born of the spirit is spirit and cannot sin. And what is born of the flesh is flesh and will and does sin. So he is, he's making a point that what comes out of us or what may come, up, come at us from other people is flesh. But we are to desire something else. Now, I'm going to make the connection in a minute, but I want to ask you a question. There's a TV commercial running, which is a guy sitting on his sofa, and different programs are competing for his attention. Hey, Marcel, watch this. You ever seen that one? You ever seen that? Come on. You've seen it? It's a guy sitting in his living room, and all of a sudden they cut to a commercial with some guys running upstairs, and they're going to bang through a door and crash open the door, and then it cuts to some dancing girls, and they're saying, hey, Marcel, watch me, and then it's the weather girl, and she says, hey, Marcel, watch me, and then they go back to the guy who's going to open the door, no, watch me, then there's a bas basketball game, watch me. They're all vying for his attention, and then finally the commercial is you don't have to have divided attention anymore. Of course not. In this society, you can watch five programs at once, right? <laughs> okay. But my point is, I want you to get this. There are things vying for your attention and vying for your desires and your lusts, your passions, your emotive attachments. There are things literally vying for what you will desire. Now, people talk about this all the time in the wrong frame, coming at it from quit doing that versus, no, 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 there's a warfare going on in this body that's fighting, and it'll fight until the day this crock of clay is laid down. These two wills inside of me, now greater is he that is in me and in you, but it doesn't change the fact that there are opposing forces to the Christian, competing for your attention, competing for what you will quest after. And believe me, an honest soul sitting here listening to me will not attempt to deny that because each person knows what it is they wrestle with and it's unique to you for your individual walk of faith. Please don't tell me I'm wrong. I know I'm right because that's every single natural creature born in the flesh. So what is being said here? You can set your desires on anything. You know, C.S. Lewis said it right when he spoke of that, uh, you know, curling up in front of the fireplace with a book can be just as grave in accomplishing Satan's purpose to get you out of the Word and away from the Word versus curling up in front of the fireplace with the good book. People cannot make the distinction because reading a book is not inherently evil, so therefore there's nothing wrong with it. But what Peter is saying is that where your desires are, in that I cannot make you have an appetite 
for the Word of God. And in fact, the tragedy, I've been saying this for weeks, but now I'll just come out and say it because I have so many friends now and everybody loves me. The tragedy is we have a lot of sickness in Christendom. We have people who are so busy. You ever been so hungry? You, well, let's, let's make the husbands the victims today, all right? Uh, so, you husbands, you know your wife's at home or your lady's at home preparing a meal for you. You know she's, she's getting stuff together for you, but you see the drive through your stomach, you're just hungry. You see the drive through ah, quick hamburger. You go through the drive through hamburger, fries, milkshake, just a little snack before you get home, right? The wife will never know. You just, ah, oh, I'm not that hungry tonight, honey. Yeah, because you filled up on junk food. That's why you have no appetite for what she's prepared for you. Most of Christianity today has no appetite for the Word of God because they're too busy filling up on junk food that looks like, it's packaged like, it's good for you, happy meal, you'll be a better person. When you eat this today, this meal, you're going you're gonna to be walking out of here smiling. That's how it's presented to you. That's, that's one concept in Christendom that has to be thought of. What are you putting into your soul? We're talking about sustenance for your soul. What are you consuming? Now, there's a lot of junk food. There's a lot of feel-good comfort food, junk food. Comfort food for the soul. Yes, if you're just, you know, just, yeah, all right, you, you're there with me. Then there's the other group. They are the anorexic Christians. They're the ones with the eating disorder. They, 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 they don't really want to go to church. They don't want to be bothered. So they're emaciated in their faith. They don't, probably don't have very much. Wrestling with and grappling with the idea, they periodically binge. They come out Christmas, Easter, special days, and they binge on those days. They're the ones with the arms lifted up the highest and the tears are coming down the most. Binge. And then they'll go back into their little reclusive world. And as long as they can just get by on the little... And this is the disease. Peter's saying something so profound here. He's not saying, oh, you little babies, like referring to the size of the child, the newborn in Christ, but referring to this most important fact that the sustenance for a child of God must be desired instinctively. This is what happens within Christianity. I've been to places where all that is done, and some, you know, brother there, he had a great meeting two weeks ago, and, you know, 50 million people got saved at his meeting. They all came down the altar, said the sinner's prayer. Now, get out of here. Not even worried about the fact that the folks that leave these great meetings have nowhere to go, and they leave thinking something, something should have happened because immediately the food that needs to be served up is not being served up, and there is no concept of telling people, listen, if, if I have been born of God, that means God has birthed me and he's birthed you, then I, like that little baby, going straight for the mother's breast for milk, I am going to desire that which only Father God in his motherly figure can give to me as sustenance for me to grow up to be what he desires me to be. Nothing else will do. There isn't anything else that has the power to say, well, should we stay on milk? Is, is it, what's the difference between milk and meat? Now, I'm going to tell you. Very simply put, Paul has this issue at the Corinthian church. Turn there with me. 1 Corinthians 3. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. Now, let me see if I can do better here, because I don't want... I want you to see this crystal clear. I could not speak to you as spiritual people, but rather as people of the flesh. Could not speak to you as nematikos, but as sarkinos, as infants, not the same word, brefo, as here in 1 Peter, but nepios, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither, are, neither now are ye able. For ye are yet carnal, whereas there is among you envying, strife, divisions. Are ye not carnal, 
and walk as men. Now, I'm trying to drive home the point that he was saying, you Corinthians haven't even attained, you can't even get to the meat, then the milk seemingly hasn't been sufficient because you're still behaving like, even Paul's saying this, carnal. There is envying, strife, and division. So basically, you're just walking as every other person here. Nothing special about you. One says, I'm, I'm of Paul. Another says, I'm of Apollos. Are, you're not carnal? Well, who is Paul? Who is Apollos? But ministers by whom you believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. That word increase is the same as our word to grow. God gave it. God does that. We, we cannot adjust our stature or standing. God does it. So then neither is he that planteth anything, nor he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now, it's pretty simple to me. These people at Corinth had not, and there are, there are groups of people, groups of churches today, the ones that are looking for the, the, the emotive event, and there's no, there is no substance. Now, I'm going to make some marvelous enemies today, but I'm going to go for broke. Dr. Scott, I remember. I remember him saying it. I remember hearing it on tape. I said it to you last week or two. You cannot be a Christian and not be a giver. If, if you're not a giver, you're not a Christian. I, I, don't, I don't care how you want to say that. That's so terrible to some people. Well, let me put it to you this way. If you're not desiring this word and you're not feeding on this word, don't call yourself a Christian. You can be like somebody who says, I'm a Jew because I was raised in a Jewish home, and you know nothing about your Judaism and your history. You just call yourself that by name, which even that you should have no entitlement to. If you're going to call yourself a Christian, you're a little Christ. You're a follower of Christ, and that follower of Christ is someone who is in the Word. Now, you say, well, that, that doesn't sit right with me because, uh, you know, I made the trip down the aisle. That may be in somebody else's mind what should happen. In my mind, there was no trip down the aisle in this book. I don't read any place where they had a trip down the aisle, but I do read many times over. In fact, I have them itemized here. Peter does not say in his writing... He doesn't say, read the word. Well, the Apostle Paul says that to Timothy. He doesn't say, think on the word. The Apostle Paul says that in the Philippians. He doesn't say, study the word, as the Apostle Paul does in 1 Timothy. He doesn't say, preach the word, or teach the word, or even search the word, such as in the book of Acts. He doesn't say, hide the word, like the psalmist. He just says one thing, one crucial thing, desire it, long for it. This Desire has to be something that is instinctive. If you're, if you're not desiring the word, Houston, we have a problem. God, help this person. Now, listen, I know there's people who start the journey and they fall off the wagon. They start. And for whatever the reason, you fall away. In fact, I know, I don't think, I know there's people listening to me right now, who are listening right now, who have fallen away technically. They, they won't get the pride under control. They won't humble themselves. They won't take their lost ambition and fizzled out ideas to the cross and say, God will give me a new chance, just like the prodigal son making that turn. Talk to him. That's why that prodigal is so important for us because we're all like that. We all have the potential. The minute you unplug from this sustenance, believe me, you'll fill your time with other things. You'll find other things. Like when people say, oh, I just don't have time for that. I'd like to study my Bible, but I just don't have time. But if you were like these babies, these newborn, do you think that a child, even for a minute, thinks about whether or not he has time. It's one thing on his mind and nothing is going to get in his way. Give me my food. And he doesn't even speak it. He just goes, nah, right? And it's feeding time. The believer should be like that, where you let nothing get in the way of your spiritual food. And Satan comes as a great 
great imitator, to plant something in your heart that inherently is not evil. Inherently, reading a book other than the good book is not evil, or going to movies or whatever it is, is not evil. Except when it makes you forget about the first thing, which is your life sustenance. Now, too much of this lesson will be spent camping out on, but it is the most important. I cannot make you have the desire imperatively. You must have it. How do I get it? He doesn't say, these are the next things that you do. He presupposes that by saying, having been born again, having been begotten from above. Now, with this, with this seed having been planted in my heart, like a child being birthed, I go to my heavenly Father for this word of sustenance. Now, it seems to me, if we were to kind of pick this apart, it seems to me quite plausible. There'll be many people that say, well, shouldn't there be something else after the milk? Jesus, when he was fighting in uh, this recorded area of the Bible, the temptation of Christ, here comes Satan using Scripture against him. And he declares, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So if we're starting somewhere, that is our sustenance. Now, don't go trying. Don't, don't, please don't tell me you're going to fight the forces around you if you can't even get to wielding, we taught on that out of Ephesians, wielding the sword of the word, which is the rhema of God. How can you wield that sword? Would you, now, would you give a sword to a baby? No. But to someone who stood on the word of God, who knows when the temptations come, when the trials come, when I'm faced with something that I know in my heart, I have this word, which is my weaponry, putting on the full armor of God, having done all, therefore stand. This is my weapon, not the carnal fighting back, which I think somehow I'm able to. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. And when the church finally gets that idea, there's only one thing that can equip you to do battle. Well, Pastor Scott, you've got, you got a battle trip going on because, you know, in my church, we don't have any battles. Okay? You know, there's one thing that I never had to be convinced of. I'm, I've told you I'm a big skeptic. Always have to question things. Never had to be convinced of the power of the devil. Because very early on, I know this is subjective. It's my experience. My experience won't do a thing for you. But very early on, I saw with my own eyes things that I couldn't explain away when I first came and worked in the ministry here. And you didn't have to convince me of it. I was it, it, Instinctively and intuitively, I knew as, as much as I could understand and the little that I did at the first, that there was a God and that he loved me and that he rescued me and saved me and delivered me and washed me and cleansed me. There was an opposing force that tried to lure me away once I committed my way without knowing all the promises of God. That's a baby for you. Not knowing the promises of God, not knowing the faith handles, just a baby that needs milk, someone to lead you along. And as you grow, and as you grow into salvation, as you, as you passively grow into salvation, you begin to understand the meat is beyond that simplistic, many people will quote John 3.16, or the quote of Proverbs. But it is when, it is literally, meat, the word, is not because I write Greek and I tear it apart. That's not even meat. Meat is the understanding that something, James even says this, has been engrafted into, can you believe I just said something out of James? Engrafted into your spirit. That is second nature to you, that without it, you cannot function. You have matured enough in the faith, you cannot function. Now, growth, intrinsically, growth is not an external concept. You've all seen kids in a snowstorm take a snowball and they'll roll it and they'll make it bigger and bigger. You've seen that. Kids roll the snowball until it's real big. Uh, okay, we live in Southern California. You've seen movies? <laughs> You've seen movies? I know, I lived in snow for a time. Lord help us. 
That is growth? No, that is not growth. That is an exterior expansion of something from the outside. Think of this conceptually and you'll grasp what I'm saying. The snowball did not grow. It was expanded as materials and things were added to expand, expand the exterior. The growth we speak of, I've already suggested this in another message when we looked at the tree in the garden and we talked about the bud, the blossom, and the fruit. The bud, you see the bud, and the bud on the tree, you say that bud may be perfect, but it is not the terminus. The blossom then comes, and the blossom may be perfect, but it is not the terminus. The fruit becomes the perfect end of this journey for which, for us in the faith life, if we want to talk about faith, we could have the bud of, the bud of hope, the blossom of faith, and the fruit, which is promise obtained having reached for a promise, taken it to myself, and now it's come to pass. Now I reach for another one, a new season in my life. I keep reaching to the next challenge. Hebrews 4 tells the same thing of Sabbathing and Sabbath rest. So we have to look at this growth from this word in the context of what does it mean and how can we better understand? Well, I'll tell you how we can better understand. 2 Peter 3.18, the very last chapter and verse of 2 Peter, gives us a little insight. Grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Well, how do you do that? See, Peter here is not saying... You're growing in grace like you're expanding in the realm of grace. No, you stand in a sphere of grace, unmerited favor. And in that realm, you stand growing in the knowledge of Christ for a purpose. The purpose is laid out in Ephesians. I know I'm making you turn all over the place, but the purpose is laid out in Ephesians. Turn there. Ephesians 4, verses 12 through 15 after we're told that God gifted some apostles, prophets, evangelists, some pastoring teachers for the perfecting of the saints to the work of the ministry, for the edifying, literally the building up of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. There it is again. Well, how do you come to the knowledge except you're in the Word and feeding in the Word? unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slave of men, cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love, may grow up, same word as here, to grow, may grow up un into him in all things, which is the head, Christ. So the development, the development is for a purpose. The development of growth that Peter speaks of here when people say, well, well is, is he saying that milk should remain? This is the error the church has made, and I've even said it. Milk is the staple for the diet for the Christian your whole life. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. However, it must come with faith, this understanding, I'm hearing the word. Now, the, the word is put into action to where I'm hanging my being on what God said. And at that point where, where my mental ascent meets that full value of saying God said it and that's that, becomes, it is the beginning point of meat. Not the delivery. Paul said, if I, I came to you with, with simple words, not in the wisdom of men, but in the spirit of God. This is the error. People think meat suggests complicated and diverse. Meat is when you've passed beyond the baby steps. A baby begins to crawl and then gets up and then plops down again using the same imagery. You've seen it. It's the silliest thing in the world. And then they laugh. And then they cry. And then they get up again all wobbly all over the place. Take a couple of crazy more steps and plop down again. 
that's still in the milk stages until the child is able to stand on his or her own, until you are able to stand on the promises. Then something more solid comes along. There's, no, there's a little less tentativeness in the mind. The next challenge of faith comes, and you're running. You're running for the shelter of God's Word. Whereas before, just little steps by little steps. The importance of this is radical. For anyone who has any concern, that's why he says, if you've tasted, you must taste it. I cannot, I cannot give you that taste. I cannot tell you, acquire the taste. And I could subjectively tell you what it tastes like. Jeremiah did. He said, sweeter than honey. Ezekiel did, like honey. In fact, most of these, including David, talks about the word as sweeter than honey, as greater than honeycomb, more precious than gold or silver. If you're not feeding on this word, you're either eating spiritual junk food that is not nourishing you, or you're starving yourself. The ones who have fallen away along the way, I don't condemn you. I don't. Well, shouldn't I be uh, bringing down the hammer and calling down uh, fire and brimstone? Absolutely not. This is the problem that Jesus addressed when he spoke of the parable of the sower and those four different soils. And only one out of four had the capacity, had the capacity to hear and receive. And in fact, in that parable, the one out of four has the capacity to grow. So no, do I, do I fault you? There are some people who, you'll bring them here. That's why I said to you, bring the people. God has to do it. God has to do the growing and the stirring and the drawing. Scripture says plainly, He's the one. No one can come except that they be drawn by Him. But I'm telling you, for the ones who have walked and fallen away, it's easy. You let anything get in your way, forgetting you're a child of God. And I don't care how old you are. I'm not saying this to be demeaning to you. I don't care how old you are. You are still His child. You are a child of the King. I don't care how old you get. You're still His child. That if you think that you don't need His sustenance in your life, you deceive yourself. So you'll have people that will fall away. And I'm telling the ones who are, maybe you're, maybe you're in a place today where you just think you've, uh, you've crossed the line with God. Maybe you've crossed the line in your mind. Maybe you think you've crossed the line. Or maybe you think you just, you know, your failure has been so great in this ministry you wanted to succeed, you wanted to keep your commitments, or whatever it is that you wanted to do, but that's your problem. God's still looking at you if you're still lamenting it today. That means that there's still hope for you. And the hope is, just like the prodigal, you'll turn around today, you talk to him. He knows exactly where you're at, by the way. There's people think, I'm just going to run and hide. Uh, you know, good luck. If God wants you, you can't hide. There's no hiding. The first thing I'd say is crucify your ambition of effort. You can try all you want. This isn't a fatalist thing. I'm, I'm trying to get to the core matters here. You can try all you want to be a better person, and morally and ethically, that may work out in the world, but as a child of God, all your efforts and my efforts are as filthy rags. He sees only one thing. Will you turn to me, and I'll turn back to you. Putting, taking, crucifying those effort goals in your mind, it's okay to have dreams. It's okay to have a goal that oh, I'd like to be. But when that becomes the target, instead of looking at that high prize and mark and pressing towards it, that being Christ, you have let effort and work slip into the fray and you've set yourself up surefire for disappointment and disengagement from the life of faith. The second thing, um, God says he can heal a backslider. There's plenty of record in that book right here. In fact, uh, one particular chapter, and I'll just read it to you. Don't turn there. Jeremiah 3. Please don't turn there because I'm not going to stay here. Only to read it for you. Jeremiah 3, 
verses 14 and 15 says, Turn, backsliding children, saith the Lord. This is before Christ, before the dispensation of the understanding of grace, unmerited favor, before the better promises, before the resurrection, God still was speaking, saying, Turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord. And here he says, For I am married unto you, I'll take you, one of a city, two of a family, bring you to Zion, and I will give you pastors according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. You can't escape that, folks. And anybody who wants to go back into this passage out of Peter and make this a behavioral lesson, like somehow we've got to put away malice and guile and hypocrisies, let me just tell you something. This presupposes having been born again, something better planted in me, that given the time, the nurturing, and the growth that God will bring if I will remain, let me just say it like this, and I don't mean to be gruesome, but like the picture in the Old Testament of El Shaddai, the God Almighty, the Breasted One, the source and sustenance for all of our provision. If I will remain at the fount of El Shaddai, if I will remain drinking from this fount, if I will remain eating this bread, if I will remain there, John 15, abiding in the vine, I will grow, and you will grow. Now, people who say, I just I can't read my Bible anymore, please don't show me your hands. We've all had a season in our life, this is honesty talking, we've all had a season in our life where it's been hard to pray. We've all had a season in our life where it's hard to go to the Word. And I can tell you two things that happen. When it's hard to pray and when it's hard to go to the Word, you can know those two ingredients together are like a suicide potion. And Satan has already got his grip around your faith cord. He's just ready. Just, there's just a little bit left if there's anything. The fact that you think about praying or the fact that you think about reading your Bible and don't suggests there's still hope. And I'm telling some of you who are, and I have one particular person in mind today as I say this who is just hanging on by a thread. Get your way back. Find those, we've called them grips of faith. Blessed Men go through valleys of weeping. It doesn't say blessed men will walk in the sunshine all the days of your life and God will never bring a storm or a wind or a thunder against you. Blessed men go through valleys of weeping. If that's where you are today, cause of your backsliding doesn't matter. Get back in the mindset, God called me and God chose me and God has cared for me. I need to get back to the sustenance that brought me. What does Jesus say to the church in the book of Revelation, you've lost your first love. Repent and do your first works over again. What were those? Back to the hearing of the Word of God, to the life of faith. These are simple concepts, but believe me, when you are sitting by yourself, ready to basically tell God, I'm done, you need somebody. Maybe I can be that somebody today for somebody else saying, no. You're going the wrong way. Now, if you keep going, that's between you and God, and then it won't be between you and God anymore. Hebrews says, having tasted of that Holy Spirit, the gift, having been enlightened, and then turning away, you crucify to yourself afresh the Son of God. So what's, what should I do? Is this a, a message to say we should stop enjoying everything else? No. But when the sustenance, when your whole desire is, I can't make you have it, I can't make you do it, I can't make you do it. But being born again, it's the first thing you're going to reach for. It's the very first thing that you're going to need that will be your, your life source. Now, there's a great promise. I kind of colloquialize it for me uh, out of at least three prophets, well, specifically... When you find your way back, that God will restore to you the years the canker worm has eaten, restore you all the unfaithfulness lost. That God, if you'll turn back to Him and turn back to the Word and quit thinking, well, this is just for babies. 
He, Paul, uh, Peter, does not specify how long they had been saved. In fact, please bear with me to point this out. Previously in this book, he says that the trial of your faith, suggesting these just didn't come uh, yesterday and appear in the church and Peter's writing them. It suggests these are people who were being tortured and tormented and persecuted. And this is why he's saying, stay in the word. This will sustain you. Mother's milk for the child not only provides nutrition, not only is it unadulterated, not contaminated, but it will give you the capacity, just like a baby receiving the, I don't know if it's called the antibodies or the, whatever it is that's in the milk that protects the child. This is what protects us, that we stay. And God says, this is the point of departure for you. Leave this word. You've unplugged the source. Now, I cannot make anyone have the taste. I can only point and say that this concept should be heralded up, that where churches are not opening up the Word of God and at least making this your staple diet for one hour, and believe me, if it's only for one hour, there are 168 hours in a week. Some of them are spent sleeping, some of them are spent sleeping, and some of them are spent eating. It'll catch on later. Some of us, never mind. Develop. You know, no one, did anybody have to tell any of you to develop a bad habit? <laughs> develop a bad habit, Henry. Yeah. Will you do that? Will you develop one? Yes, sir. Good. <laughs> you just naturally develop them. And I'm not here to catalog the laundry list. I'm simply saying... Now, we know that these things live in us and we are susceptible to them. And what is being suggested that is in desiring this milk, some good faith habits will come. Now, if that's so far left field for some of you, I'm sorry, but I am going to just say this and then I'm done. For the better part of what Peter's going to say, we'll start with being born again, go from babies feeding on desiring the unadulterated, unadorned, untwisted, uh, unmerchandised, un, uh, whatever you want to call it, just pure word of God that you must taste. He's going to move from that imagery. He'll move into another imagery of we've become building blocks in a temple. We've become priests and we've become sacrifices. This is the starting point to bring us into an understanding that something greater has happened, just like to these persecuted saints, something greater has happened to enable you. And he says one thing. Here he's not saying have faith. It seems to be axiomatic and self-evident. The faith must come by the product. Here, at least, there was no Bible at his time. There was no capacity to say, oh, chapter and verse, sure. But only this, desire it. Desire with a desire that can only come from the inside. And, and if you're trying to desire it, and the taste can't be acquired, it must be within you. That's why we go back to being born again. Now, the only thing that I'm, I'm thinking is that hopefully today someone, somewhere listening to me will say, this is why we need God's Word. Because without it, the church is dying. Now, this Word, this Word-based ministry remains for that reason. Your pastor understands. This is not something for little kids when we say the milk of the Word. This is sustenance for all of his children. I said bread, maybe a crumb, or maybe it's going to be a buffet, but let me change that and say maybe it'll be a drop for some of you who were thirsty, and for others, maybe today it was the beginning of refreshing the palate of what it tastes like when God's Word is in your mouth and in your mind and in your heart, and then suddenly you recognize, I can't be without this Word. I need this Word. That's why I need to be here next week. That's my message. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.